rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's Prophecy Update. An international conference on achieving peace in the Middle East was due to begin on May 30th. However, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry could not attend because of a scheduling conflict. Paris announced today that the date of the conference would be shifted to June 3rd, allowing the U.S. to attend. Kerry has confirmed that he will now attend the conference and hoped the way could be cleared for relaunching talks and achieving an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. An agreement is going to be reached. The only question is when. Whenever the prophesied peace accord is signed, it will mark the beginning of the final seven years to Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus. Will this be the time for world that world leaders have dreamed of and Israeli leaders have feared. We'll soon see. Well, momentous news to say the least. We're going to talk about it today. Before we do, however, I want to tell you about a prophecy conference this weekend. It'll be Saturday evening and Sunday morning. I'll be speaking on America's God-given destiny. That's this Saturday, May the 21st at 6 p.m., it will be held in Neenan, Wisconsin, Nina, Wisconsin, 123 East Wisconsin Avenue in Nina. Now on Sunday morning, I will be speaking on prophetic fulfillments, late breaking prophetic fulfillments, and that will include a question and answer session, which is proving to be immensely popular with people. People really have a lot of questions they wanna ask, we throw it wide open. You can ask whatever you would choose to ask. Now, the Sunday morning session is going to be held at the Cross Point Church, 670 North Green Bay Road in Nina, Wisconsin. So one more time, that's Saturday evening, 6 o'clock, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, you are welcome to all of those sessions. There's no charge to attend. There will be a free offering, a free will offering received. We would love to see you there. I think every American needs to attend this conference where I will be speaking on America's God-given destiny because if you know from the Bible America's destiny and you're an American, then you will understand your destiny in the times that are just ahead. These are not ordinary times. We are in the end time now. The end time's not coming. The end time is right now. And since we're entering in the period of more prophetic fulfillment than any other time in all of history, all of history, we are entering that time right now. It is so vital that all of us understand exactly what is going on. Well, listen, I want to get right into our program today because so many things are happening. Uh, John Kerry has now committed to go to the Paris Conference on Palestinian-Israeli Peace. This article comes from the Jerusalem Post just today. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said on Thursday he will attend a conference in Paris on June the 3rd to discuss possible Israeli-Palestinian peace efforts, but said it was up to both sides to decide whether they were ready to negotiate. The parties themselves have to make the decision to negotiate, and in that, clearly there will have to be some compromise. Without compromise, it is not possible, Kerry told a news conference during a meeting of NATO foreign ministers. 
I will work with the French. I will work with the Egyptians. I will work with the Arab community in good faith in an effort to see if we can find a way to help the parties see their way to come back, he added. Now, I want to make sure that we really understand what the stakes are here because the stakes are high. I want to make sure that uh, as we start our discussion today, that all of us are able to perceive what is really going on. Here's what's going to happen at this conference. This conference is the international conference that Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinians, has been pushing towards for a long time. He believes if he can avoid one-on-one -on -one negotiations and get in the presence of the world community, that the nations of the world will gang up on Israel and pressure Israel to do what he wants Israel to do. Now, Abbas has repeatedly said Israel must withdraw to 67 borders making room for the establishment of a new Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Israel has repeatedly said, we are willing to make painful compromises. We are willing to allow the creation of a Palestinian state, but we cannot withdraw the 67 borders because they are indefensible. Now, the contention that they must withdraw to 67 borders is built on the misconception that there was a Palestinian state there before 1967. Furthest thing from the truth. This area was part of the British mandate, which the United Nations offered to the Palestinians back in 1947, and they flat turned it down and said, we're not interested. And then all the time that Jordan controlled it, from 1949 until 1967, they didn't bother to set up a Palestinian state there either. So that's not really what they want. What they really want is the annihilation of the state of Israel. I mean, the day after Israel declared independence within the area that the United Nations had allotted for them, they declared their independence, they were attacked by six Arab countries, the main country being Jordan. Jordan then captured the West Bank area and stayed there for the next 19 years until 1967. When they again attacked Israel, Israel counterattacked, drove them back into their own country, back across the Jordan River, and took possession of the rest of the British mandate, the area that's called the West Bank. It's never been a Palestinian state. However, there are a lot of Arabs there that now call themselves Palestinians. This conflict, I want to make sure that everybody understands. Many people say, if you get peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, we can have peace on earth. That's the core of all the conflict in the Middle East. Well, it's not true because there were wars between different Arab countries, between Iraq and Iran. They fought for eight years with, eight, with uh, a million fatalities. There have been many other wars. They're fighting right now in Syria, and they're also fighting in Iraq. Uh, they're fighting in Yemen, and there are no Israelis there. So there's something about the Arab mentality. They're always going to fight wars, and it continues, but... The world community has bought into the narrative that it's the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that's the root of all of these evils, even though it is not true. As a matter of fact, the Palestinians like to say the settlements are the root of the problem, but guess what? There were no settlements before 67, and the Palestinians still would not make peace with Israel. There were no settlements, zero from 1948 until 1967, none. And yet the Arabs continued to attack and vow to drive Israel into the sea. Uh, Nasser of Egypt, Assad of Syria, and King Hussein of Jordan all fought against Israel in the 67 war. And to the whole world's astonishment, Israel absolutely routed them in six days. It's called the Six Day War. 
Okay, so they're coming together in a few days now, June the 3rd. They're coming together for this international conference, which Israel opposes because they understand that the international community is going to gang up, up upon them. Now, if they come up with some kind of the parameters for a plan, and then if they end up putting it in the form of a resolution before the United Nations, and then if the UN would pass a resolution demanding that Israel withdraw to certain borders, then that would take the force of international law. And if Israel were, would refuse to comply, they now find themselves having to fight against the world community. All right, let's talk about what's likely to happen at this conference. The International Quartet, which has, was founded actually to pound out a peace agreement and has continued to work on it since it was formed in 2002, I think it was, but yet to no avail. They are putting together a report, hopefully finished by the 25th of this month, preparing this report for this international conference in Paris. Now, the conference in Paris was in danger of being aborted before it ever began. If the U.S. would have refused to go, then there would have been no legitimacy because as long as the U.S. is willing to wield its veto power at the U.N., anything they do would be useless. Now then, though, somehow, and I don't know for sure how they did it, they have convinced the U.S. to send a delegation to this international conference. Now, did you notice in what I read that Kerry was, was saying that he's going to go there and he hopes to be able to get the two sides to come together to negotiate. But the idea of this international conference is to get the world community to agree on what a peace should look like. If all of the international community, including the U.S., could come to an agreement as to what the peace should look like, now all of a sudden you can take it before the U.N. Security Council and the U.S. would not veto it. President Obama has threatened repeatedly, if you don't get peace with the Palestinians, we cannot guarantee you that we will protect you with our veto. Mr. Martin Indyke, who was the special envoy to the peace talks of 2014, he issued that threat very openly. So Abbas is hoping that this international conference is pushing toward that goal. Israelis and Palestinians are not invited to this first summit. However, the plan is to define the parameters of a peace deal here and then to call an international meeting later on in the summer where Israelis, Palestinians, and the whole world will be invited, preparing for the fall when the UN General Assembly takes place, when there could possibly be a resolution passed. Okay, well, let's just say you and I are a fly on the wall at this meeting on June the 3rd. What's likely to happen there? Well, the first thing will be, undoubtedly, the finding of the quartet. Okay, here's where we think things are right now. This is the Palestinian position. This is the Israeli position. And here are the differences in the middle. Israel refuses to give up Jerusalem, to divide Jerusalem. The Palestinians say, without East Jerusalem as our capital, no peace. Then they've got the problem of this Temple Mount that is a continual source of conflict. So how can we solve the Temple Mount? The Muslims say, it's ours. The Jews say, that's the site of our first temple, the site of our second temple. It's the place where our God said, I will put my name there forever. It's the center of Jewish life. We will never agree to surrendering it right now just for the sake of peace. We are allowing the Muslim walk to administer it, but we are never going to permanently surrender it. Someday there has to be an agreement that will allow us to have access. As a matter of fact, one of the members of the Israeli Knesset actually proposed a law in the Knesset that the Temple Mount will be placed under a sharing arrangement. 
then what are we going to do with this 800,000 Jews that are now living across the 1967 borders? Are we going to bring the bulk of them that are in population centers close to Israel, close to Jerusalem, and allow them to be annexed by Israel and then give territory of equal acreage to the Palestinians from another area so that we can say we got 100% of our land back. Now that's one of the propositions that's been made and was apparently thought workable in times past. And what about these Jews that live out there so far that it's not practical for Israel to annex them, that they will be a part of the territory that's going to be the Palestinian state when it's formed. What do we do with those Jews? Now, these are all issues that they will be wrestling with when they get together a few days from right now. Now comes John Kerry. Martin and Dyke will probably be with him. They will be there because they're the last ones to sit down at the table with the Palestinians and the Israelis. This was back beginning in 2013, continuing on to 2014. Let me give you a little background. President Obama had pressured Benjamin Netanyahu so much to quit building the settlements that Netanyahu said, okay, I'm going to declare a 10-month moratorium on any building of settlements. 10 months I'll give you to get the Palestinians to the peace table. So Israel quit building for 10 months. Obama kept trying to get the Palestinians to the table. One excuse after another, can't do it, can't, can't come right now, on and on and on and on. All the time, Israel was not pounding a nail. Finally, when the 10 months was just about up, about two weeks before the deadline. Who shows up for the peace talks? Mahmoud Abbas. He comes in with all of his fanfare. I'm here to talk. And Netanyahu said, now look, I gave you 10 months. And when the moratorium is over, I'm going to start building again. Well, the Obama administration tried to pressure him. Don't do it now. We've got him at the table. Abbas said, you should have had it at the table. Um, Netanyahu said, you should have been at the table 10 months ago. This is all theater. They're only here to try to get you to pressure us and to quit building the settlements. And we're not going to do it. If we make peace, we can move our borders wherever they are. But as of right now, we gave you 10 months. A boss played you like a drum and we're not going to do this. So consequently, that's what's going to be. That's what happened there. Well, then they, they negotiated off and on from August all the way through March. And they were pushing. Kerry was pushing with all of his might. I mean, the man traveled incessantly, negotiated between Israel and the Palestinians for nine months. He was negotiating back and forth and doing everything he could to put this peace deal together. However, there were some things Israel was unwilling to do and there were some things that the Palestinians were unwilling to accept. One week before the deadline, the deadline I think was April the 24th of 2014, they were supposed to get the deal done. And Abbas had said, I will not go to the UN. I'll give you a chance to get this peace deal done. One week before the deadline, when America was using all of its muscle to force things, Abbas suddenly announces that he has signed a unity agreement with Hamas, who's on the official terrorist list of the United States of America. So now Abbas goes off and forms a unity government, supposedly, with Hamas, and Hamas has it in his constitution that they are dedicated to the destruction of the nation of Israel. So is Israel going to negotiate with someone who has vowed her destruction? Because they now supposedly have a unity government. They're going to put the West Bank and Gaza all back together again. Well, you know what happened. The peace talks aborted. 
Been no talk since that time. Of course, then there was the continual rocket attacks on southern Israel until after about 8,000 rockets were fired from Gaza, Israel attacked Hamas, destroyed all the houses of all of the Hamas leaders. A couple of thousand people died. The carnage was terrible. Many Israelis would have died. I think maybe 60 of them did. The only reason more did not is because Israel's new Iron Dome technology worked beyond anyone's imaginations. They picked off rocket after rocket. I'm talking about when those rockets would be fired at Israel, the Iron Dome would shoot them down. Now to show you the level of this achievement, it's like hitting a bullet with a bullet. We're talking about rockets that fly at tremendously high speeds. It's as if you were trying to hit a, a bullet with a bullet. Israel and the United States had worked together on the Iron Dome technology. It was incredibly successful. So while Hamas kept on fighting and losing a lot of people, Israel lost some, but not that many. So it was a smashing victory, and yet the Palestinians declared they won. I mean, they lost 2,000, Israel lost 58, so they won 2,000 to 58. Uh, I don't know how you keep scoring that kind of a ball game where the opponent scores 2,000 runs and you score 58, and then you turn around and claim victory. Well, that's the way they do. They're ludicrous. But anyway, the other thing that happened was the Palestinians are masters at trying to set up Israel for war crime charges. What they do is they go into hospitals and schools and they put their fighters there and their ammunition depots there. And then when Israel knows they're there and attacks them and then a few civilians are killed as a result, it's all Israel's fault. Israel is guilty of war crimes. Well, all of that happened between 2014 and 2016 right now. In the meantime, over the last few months, the knife intifada began. And Palestinian after Palestinian attacked Israeli civilians, anybody they can get their hands on, bus stops, on the buses, uh, down in the streets of Jerusalem, wherever, any place they could attack a Jewish person, they did. And I think over that, over the last few months, around 30 Jews have died. And again, the death toll on the Arab side was much higher because the police were very alert. I don't know for sure how many have been killed on the Palestinian side. So that's been raging. But it's taken its toll on the Jewish psyche. They want to solve the problem. Yet, there are some things they are unwilling to do. All right, now, Kerry knows where the lines are. That he knows what Israel will do. He just finished two years ago negotiating with them intensively for nine months. They wrangled back and forth. And that's not the first time, by the way. So it's pretty well understood where the Palestinians stand and where the Israelis stand. So at this conference that will be convened in Paris on June the 3rd with the specter of a plane being blown out of the sky this morning, a plane going from Paris, France to Cairo, Egypt, with all that specter as a background, with ISIS declaring we are going to make a full assault on Israel and we're not going to fight within any borders. We'll fight you wherever we find you. This is an international conflict. With all that pressure coming down with the world wanting to have some respite, some peace, that's going to be the climate of the June 3rd meeting. We've got to get this deal done. Now, here's what the planners really want. They really want the world community to come together and say, okay, here's what we think is fair and here's what we think is doable. Yes, it may cause Israel some pain and yes, it may cause the Palestinians some pain. There's only one way to get there, just like Kerry said in the article I read, and that's through compromise. Both sides have to compromise. 
So here we are in Paris, France, a couple of weeks from right now, and they're trying to get this deal done. Now, I want to remind you that if they're successful, it will be the greatest prophetic fulfillment in the last 2,000 years because this peace agreement that they're attempting to conclude if it is successfully signed, will mark the beginning of the final seven years to the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus. Now think about that. They're trying to get it done this year. Will I walk to this microphone yet this year and announce to you that you and I have just entered the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon. I don't know whether I'll do it this year or not. They're certainly going to try. And President Obama wants it done before he leaves office. And the world community wants it done before he leaves office because if Donald Trump gets in there, they don't believe that he's ever going to pressure Israel like Obama is willing to pressure Israel. And will Obama fulfill his threat to not use the veto power to protect Israel? He well might do it. He doesn't have to run again for office and he's already signaled that he might do it. So all of these issues are converging right now. Well, hope it doesn't sound too complex to you. I'm trying to describe to you what is going on right now. I have a little bit more I want to tell you when we get back. However, let me pause just a moment. Don't forget the Prophecy Conference in Nina, Wisconsin, Saturday night and Sunday morning. If you are within two or three or four hours drive, be there. It's going to be a dynamic, important conference. In the meantime, if you're not yet a partner with End Time Ministries, we got the biggest job in the world to do. The Bible says this gospel shall be preached in all of the world. That's our goal. And we can do it together. Become a partner with End Time Ministries. Call us. 800 End Time is the number to call. 800-363-8463. Stay with us. When current events are found in Bible prophecy, it's astonishing. At End Time Ministries, we are seeing them unfold every day, and so can you. We've put together a current events in Bible prophecy package for anyone who wants to understand like never before. Irvin Baxter and his dedicated staff have spent hundreds of hours of research and study, and in doing so have discovered that current events in Bible prophecy are telling the same story. These 13 DVDs will prepare you to be ready in this extraordinary time that God has destined you to live. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and save over 20% when you buy the current events in Bible Prophecy Package. All my life I have heard the statement, nobody's perfect. But one day Hebrews 10:14 caught my attention. It says, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I attempted to reconcile this statement with what I had viewed as the many imperfections in myself. Could it be that there are human beings on this earth that God considers perfect? In You Are Perfect, Urban Baxter explains what it means to be sanctified and why God sees those that are sanctified as perfect. This teaching has given people peace and security in their walk with God because of new understanding of how God sees them. This lesson is available on DVD, CD, in printed format, or even digital download to tell you not what's wrong with you, but what's right with you. You are perfect. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com to get yours today. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to continue to listen to today's broadcast. Well, exciting times to say the least. Prophetic times, you better believe it, happening all around us. Now, I'm going to take your calls today and I want to go ahead and do that right now. I have some more information for you later, but right now, let's go out to the state of Washington. Jim is calling from there. Hello, Jim, what's on your mind? I am rather have Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Jim. You're on the air. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your ministry. I've been listening for maybe right now it's half year. And uh, I'm really uh, growing with uh, 
about all the uh, things you mentioned about uh, the end time and all the prophecies. But I have one uh, question about uh, in uh, Gospel Matthew 24. Yes. Uh, 32 to 36, I uh, mentioned about the uh, fig tree. So which one is uh, really mentioned about that? Well, yeah, can you explain a little bit about the uh, fig tree? Okay, Matt, uh, Jim, I'm having a little bit of problem understanding. Would you state your question one more time for me? Yeah, I have a question about the uh, fig tree on uh, 32, verse 32 to uh, 30. Oh, yes, I, I understand now. I, I've got you. Let me answer. Uh, Jesus there said, hear the parable of the fig tree. When the fig tree puts forth its buds, you know that summer is nigh. He said, likewise, when you see these things that I've told you about here in the 24th chapter of Matthew, when you see these things, then know that this generation shall not pass until all things be fulfilled. So Jesus was saying, when you see the things I've told you in Matthew chapter 24, then the generation that sees these things will then know that they will not pass from the earth until everything is wrapped up. Immediately before he said this in verse 32, in verse 29 through 31, Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, and then shall appear the sign of the com coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven, and he shall send his angels to gather his elect. So he was talking about the second coming, the rapture of the church there. And then he immediately, once he told us about that, he immediately shifted gears and let us know that there would be ways for us to know that we're the generation that would not pass until we saw the second coming of Jesus Christ. So now many people have taught that the fig tree is a symbol of Israel and that when the nation of Israel was reborn in 1948 that the generation that lived at that time would have to be still on the earth at the time of the second coming. There is no biblical proof for Israel being the fig tree. Israel is known as the olive tree in scripture, but never is it known as the fig tree. Another passage, another one of the gospels recording the same incident said, when you see the fig tree and all the trees bud in the spring, then you know summer is nigh. So it's not the fig tree that's significant. It's the fact that when you see the budding of the trees, you know summer is nigh. Likewise, when you see the things that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, then know that this generation shall not pass until everything is wrapped up, including the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that's okay. the meaning, Jim. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, God bless okay. you and thank you for calling. Now, before we go back, let me take a couple more callers. Pam's calling from right here in Texas. Hello, Pam. Oh, hi. I'm calling from Dallas, Fort Worth. And I, I think it's terrible that, that we don't have a voice out here. Um, talk shows in general won't let anybody on. They just screen their callers real, real finely, you know, and they want to know exactly what you're going to say. And, um, but, and we had one time, at one time in this area, we had a talk show, a screener who was known as a communist. So <laughs> I said, your screener needs a raise. <laughs> but what uh, my problem is that people spend all this time, we talk about the presidential race, and we don't care what happens locally. I had 10 people or so vote in my election, a local city council meeting. And there's where uh, we're having most of our troubles because God judges us on what we do for, for our own um, leaders in our own hometowns. Like, okay, we have a sheriff, this whole Tar 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 Tarrant County sheriff, and uh, he keeps running down the Christian sheriff we used to have, and that sheriff put in something called a God pod. And I have met at least two people who were in jail and who win that God, God pod, and they're more spiritual than anybody I know or in, in all the schools we have around here, the Bible schools. And um, 
And as soon as he was elected, he took the God pot out immediately. And he had his his uh, 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 shindig for his election in, in a saloon. Well, and he makes national news for coming against a kid who was drinking, see, and kill people. Well, Pam, like you say, the the national politics tends to get all of the attention pretty much. But it is important what is happening locally because uh, the local leaders, many of them are on their way to becoming state leaders and then national leaders, as we have already seen. So you make a really strong point that what happens locally is important. The school boards are so important uh, to determine what will be taught in the schools, what kind of textbooks will be used. I don't even know whether uh, that power still lies within the venue of the uh, local school boards or not. But if not, it certainly should. Um, One thing I'd like to say is this. I remember when George Bush Sr. was running for office Uh, for the presidency, he promised to abolish the education department because education used to be all with the states and there was no federal funds given to the schools. Everything was local. Well, then they established a federal department of education and the uh, SAT scores have gone down ever since. And so Herbert Walker Bush, he announced that he would destroy, do away with the Department of Education. But of course, he said one thing and did another. He didn't destroy the Department of Education and nobody has had the backbone to do it ever since. Anyway, uh, but once they take everything federal, then it becomes very remote and it becomes politics as usual. So uh, you make a good point, Pam. I appreciate you calling. Thank you very much. Now, before we go to any more calls, just let me quickly go back to what we're dealing with today. And that is this meeting that will be held on June the 3rd in Paris, when they're hoping to pound out the international communities, hoping to pound out the parameters for a Middle East peace deal. Now, I promise you, a thing called the Clinton parameters will be there. Uh, Bill Clinton pounded out a peace deal with Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak way back in 2000. And the terms that he reached before everything broke down, those terms were called the Clinton parameters. Bill Clinton recently said to the Palestinians, I had a deal worked out, you'd have gotten all of Gaza back, but you refused and Arafat walked away. So consequently, uh, those particular parameters are now called the Clinton parameters, and many people think that if a deal is actually achieved, it will be along the line of the Clinton parameters. Okay, so what's happening today in Israel? Well, Netanyahu was negotiating with Isaac Herzog, the head of the Labor Party, He was on the verge of bringing him into his government and turning the foreign ministry and the peace negotiations over to him. And Herzog is adamant that Jerusalem has to be redivided. Israel has to withdraw to 67 borders and that would be the way to peace. Apparently Netanyahu fell into this spell for a while, but he just couldn't bring himself to give East Jerusalem back to the Palestinians. When Herzog insisted, I will have total control or else I'm not coming in. Finally, Netanyahu behind the scenes was negotiating with another person, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, to possibly come into his government. Well, at the last minute when he felt like that Herzog was demanding more than he could give, he turned to Lieberman, who has the reputation for being right wing. However, If you look closer, Lieberman is not as right-wing as he sounds. He asked for three things. He asked to be defense minister, which means he's in charge of the military of Israel. He asked for the death sentence for terrorists. Now, Israel's not had a death sentence. They actually have a law in the books, but they've not executed anyone since they executed Eichmann in 1962. But those were the conditions that Lieberman asked for to come into the coalition to give Netanyahu a bigger cushion so that his government would not be toppled. 
Now, he only brought six votes, but Netanyahu went from a majority of one to a majority of seven now. Well, if you had one or two people rebel against you, they could topple your government now, then it would take a more significant number. So they've now brought Lieberman in, and he's over the defense. Now, here's what one article said about Lieberman. Despite the Palestinian Authority's accusation of extremism, Lieberman has been called out for not taking any right-wing actions in his previous positions of power. He used to be in the Netanyahu government and of promoting a leftist agenda. He's actually been accused of leftism, seen in his election campaign calling to give up the Triangle region in the north where over 300,000 Arab citizens of Israel, of Israel live as part of creating a Palestinian state. There's a triangle up in the north part of Israel where 300,000 Arabs live. He says what we need to do is to move the wall over and let those 300,000 Arabs become a part of the new Palestinian state. We need to keep the parts where Israel is. That was his proposition. It was his version of transferring population. Now, he doesn't want to move anybody. He just wants to move the border so that the Arabs would be on the Arab side and the Israelis would be on the Israeli side. Uh, so it's very interesting. Since he has strong ideas about how to come, uh, come up to a peace agreement, could it be that he and Netanyahu will work together for this new approach? Don't know the answer. All I'm telling you is there's a peace deal coming and the international community is meeting on it June the 3rd. We live in interesting times. Back to the phones. Helen is calling from Canada. Hello, Helen. What's on your mind today? Yes. Uh, how are you, Mr. Baxter? I'm wonderful. Thank you. Good. Um, I have uh, two little questions. The first is, uh, yesterday on your program, we saw um, a big chart on, on the wall called Armageddon. Is, is it possible to obtain a, a copy of this chart by email? I will have to arrange that for you. That's part of a brand new lesson I'm teaching from here to Armageddon. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll talk to our management team and see if we can arrange that for you, Helen. Okay. Would you, you want me to um, wait for after the break for the yes, other questions? Yes, please, please hold after the break. I'm sorry I brought you on so close to the break. I'll come right back to you as soon as we get back from this break. You're listening to End of the Age and important things are breaking in the prophecy world today. Stay with us. One day I was listening to End of the Age, much like you are now, when a commercial came on about the Salvation Package. It's a set of four DVDs in which Irvin teaches about topics like Nicodemus' question to Jesus, what must I do to be born again? I remember Irvin said in the commercial, if you don't love the truth, don't get this because it will make you mad. Well, I was hungry for the truth, so I did get it, and I am so glad I did. I'd been studying the Bible for many years, but learned there was more in the scriptures about what it means to be born again. When the disciples came to Jesus and asked, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus said, take heed of false teaching, for many will come in my name and deceive many. Now I know what Jesus was talking about when he made that statement, and I won't be deceived. The salvation package changed my life and my eternity. I'm so thankful for that commercial I heard. That's why today I wanted to record one too, for someone out there listening, searching for the truth. You'll find it in the salvation package. Get the four DVD set for $65 or the individual DVDs for $20 each. We're going right back to the phone. Helen is on hold. Helen, I apologize for bringing you on so close to our break, but welcome back. Continue. Yes. Okay. Uh, my second question, Mr. Baxter, uh, a friend uh, told me that uh, he, he interpret, interpret what is written in Daniel chapter 9 
uh, verse 27, that he will make the, the, the sacrifice to stop. He will, uh, yes, he will uh, make the sacrifice to stop and also make a solid alliance. And he said that this could mean it is Jesus at the first coming uh, that did that. Uh, stopping the sacrifice and make a solid alliance, which is the New Testament alliance. So uh, how would you answer to a friend who tells me this? Uh, yes, Helen, that's a common teaching out there. They teach, the, the scripture says, he will, call, will make a covenant with many, will confirm a covenant with many for seven years. And in the middle of the seven years, he'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to stop and for the overspread of abominations, he make it desolate. So the he there does three things. He confirms the covenant, he stops the sacrifice, and he places the abomination of desolation. Some people teach that's Jesus Christ. Now verse 26, immediately above verse 27, says that after the 62nd, 62 weeks of years, Messiah will be cut off not cut off in the middle of the 70th. It says he will be cut off after the seven weeks and 62 weeks of years. So Messiah was crucified at the end of the 483 years, not halfway through the final seven years. That's point number one. Point number two, if we want to find out who the he is referring to, the law of English is you always go to the last mentioned noun to see who the pronoun is referring to. The last mentioned noun in verse 26 says, and the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the sin in the sanctuary. And then it says, and he shall confirm the covenant. The prince that shall come is the uh, antecedent to the pronoun he. The prince that shall come is the Antichrist. When it says the people of the prince that shall come, it's referring to the Romans. They destroyed the city and the sanctuary in 70 AD. That everybody knows, it's history, that the Romans destroyed the city and the sanctuary. The Bible teaches the Antichrist will preside over a reborn Holy Roman Empire. So he's, the Antichrist is the prince that shall come. Then it goes on to say the Antichrist, he shall confirm the covenant. And then in the middle of the seven years, he's going to cause the sacrifice to stop. Now the people that hold this view you're describing claim that Jesus caused the sacrifice to stop through his sacrifice on Calvary. But let's see if the scripture bears that out. Go two chapters later in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. And this is all about the Antichrist. It says, an arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and they shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. So to believe that the he is Jesus, you have to believe Jesus is the one that places the abomination that makes desolate. Jesus never placed an abomination anywhere. And furthermore, since the scriptures clearly say that the, Antichrist, that the Messiah would be taken away, cut off after the 69th week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, not in the middle of the 70th week, just what they're teaching does not hold water. So the, one more time to reiterate, the Antichrist is the he who confirms the covenant. He's also the he that stops the sacrifice and places the abomination of desolation. Daniel 11 31 through 33 clearly states it's the Antichrist that takes away the sacrifice and places the abomination of desolation. So that he is not Jesus Christ. He is the Antichrist. Good. Thank you very much. I took note and I will tell my friend to listen to your program of today. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Helen, and thanks for being on hold with us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Things are shifting worldwide right now. And this move by Netanyahu to bring Avigdor Lieberman into his cabinet, into the most important position, defense minister. Many people for years have believed that Lieberman someday would be the prime minister of Israel. They look at him as a strong man. Well, this could be the first shot out of the cannon toward that eventually happening. There will be a successor to Benjamin Netanyahu it could be 
Avigdor Lieberman. It's going to be interesting to watch. Okay, right back to the phones now, and Wayne is calling from Ohio. Hello, Hi, Wayne. What's on your year, mind? I'm thinking, by the sense of this presidential election, by the end of this year, could be the sign of the coming of Mark of the Beast. That could, it's a possibility of the Mark of the Beast could take place by the end of this year, because I watched Jack Van Empey, and he, and he said that, uh, that 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 that, uh, that that it will take place before the year 2017. Everybody will be microchipped by the year 2017. Impossible now, to you. Now, Wayne, I, Wayne, I'm not sure what Jack Van Empey had to say, but it's not possible for the Mark of the Beast to be implemented yet this year. Let me tell you why. The Bible teaches that the Antichrist will come to power halfway through the final seven years. The final seven years has not begun yet. Consequently, the Antichrist will not come to power. The Bible says in Revelation 13, 5, that power will be given unto him to continue 42 months. The reign of the Antichrist begins when he stands on the Temple Mount claiming to be Messiah and God. It actually says he will sit in the temple of God. There's no temple on the temple mount yet. Once the peace agreement is signed, they will build their temple, the Jewish people will, during the first three and a half years. Then the Antichrist will stop the sacrifice, sit in the temple of God, claiming to be God. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, then shall that man of sin be revealed. That's when he will be recognized as the leader of the world. And that's when Christians who know their Bibles will recognize him as the Antichrist. So consequently, you can't take the mark of the beast until the beast is in power. The mark of the beast will be implemented during the final three and a half years of the seven year period, the final seven year period. So I don't know for sure what uh, Jack uh, had to say really. I, I don't want to contradict him openly on the air. All I'm telling you is that the mark of the beast cannot be implemented in 2016, nor in 2017, nor in 2018, because even if they sign the agreement yet this year, then the Antichrist would not be revealed until three and a half years after the signing of the agreement. So that's important for us to understand. Okay. Okay. It, uh, uh, it looked like it looked like we might get a president in the office that might uh, that might cause us problems uh, that 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 could show signs of a coming world dictator and or maybe uh, we may have a nuclear strike or martial law or something. Well, Wayne, here's what we know for sure: the Bible prophesies that the United States is not going to be a part of the world government. Some president is going to get elected that's going to pull us out of this internationalism that we've been drifting into. And furthermore, the United States is going to stand with Israel. So it looks like that the United States is going to correct the slide that we're in right now toward globalism and one world government. And we're going to go back the other way. Now, whether it happens at this time of this election, it looks like now's the time for it to happen. And, of course, the amazing things of this election uh, certainly seem to bear that out right now. So it's important for us to understand. Uh, I want to say to everyone, I'm going to let you go, Wayne. Thank you very much for your phone call. I want to say to everybody, if you want to know what's ahead for America, we've got a brand new DVD called America's God-Given Destiny. Now, we're, we're having a very special promotion for this because we want to help Jews get back to Israel before it's too late. And they've got to get back there before the Antichrist takes power in Europe. So we may have two to four years to get all those 1.6 million Jews out of Europe and back to Israel. So we have launched a very special promotion called the Another Jewish Holocaust Fund. There's another Holocaust coming. Jesus prophesied about it when he said, then will be great tribulation such as never been before, nor ever again shall be. So we don't have a lot of time to waste here. So what we're doing is this. For every person that would donate $1,000 to the Another Jewish Holocaust Fund, we're going to send you a beautiful picture of the United States guarding Israel all the way to the end. The Bible prophesies the U.S. is going to guard Israel. We're also going to send you the physical DVD called America's God-Given Destiny. And we're also going to send you a letter that you can sign to the Jewish friend that you will be helping. And I will hand carry those letters 
to the Jewish agency the next time I'm in Israel. And I will present that, these letters to the people that you help. It's going to be a wonderful thing to do. So if God's blessed you where you could denote, donate $1,000 to the Another Jewish Holocaust Fund, I urge you to do it. If you're not in a position to do that, but yet you would like to, to hear the message, America's God-given destiny, we have arranged a way for, so that anybody can hear it. For a donation of any size, you can download the message, America's God-given destiny. Here's all you have to do. Go to endtime.com. That's E-N-D-T-I-M-E dot com. Click on the donate button there on our homepage. It will, you can immediately enter the amount of your donation, whether it's $5, $10, $100, $500, whatever it is you want to do. You enter that there and it will give you your password to download this DVD, America's God, or this video, America's God Given Destiny. You can download it onto your computer and there you will be able to listen to it. So for a donation of any amount, you can get the message because we did it this way because we want everybody to hear it. At the same time, America's destiny, one of our destinies is to protect Israel. And if you want to see scriptural proof for all I'm saying to you, then donate to America's God-given destiny or else donate $1,000 to the Another Jewish Holocaust Fun. If you want to do that, you can call us right now. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Well, let me see. Do we have any more time? I'll tell you what. Those of you that are remaining on the screen, I'm going to ask you to call back tomorrow. Tomorrow is open line. I'm sorry that we have run out of time here today uh, because, well, there's a lot brewing right now. Uh, let me say to all of you out there, if you have been through all 14 lessons of our Understanding the End Time series, hold your hand up right now. Okay, a lot of you have your hands up. To those of you that were not able to hold up your hand, you're the ones I want to talk to. My goal is to get every one of you to go through these 14 DVDs because you and I are entering in the time of more prophetic fulfillment than ever in the history of the world. And you're going to be blindfolded and some of it's going to be dangerous, but this series is going to educate you. So you're going to know where the minds are and you're going to know what you should be doing. The number to call to get your own copy of the 14 DVD series, which is entitled Understand the End Time. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. You've got to get through this series right now. And anybody can understand, you will understand these teachings. The number to call once again, understand the end time, 1-800-END-TIME. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.